you hear that from the president of Iceland, just keep your head up. It's, yes. all, it's all going to work out eventually, right? <laughs> Very Tataretas type of Tataretas. Things will work out so yes. well. Things Iceland, the place you get the inside scoop on Icelandic nature, culture, history, and language from an expat living in the country, which is me, Jules, and I have the honor of being here today and having my guest, who is the president of Iceland, with me, Johannesson. And we are in Bessasade, which is the residence of the president. So thank you so much for allowing us to come to your home to talk to you today. My pleasure and honor and uh... Good to have you here. Thank you. And we're in the library specifically, and you are a historian, so I feel like this is the perfect place <laughs> for you to be. Yeah, I like it here. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Like your wife a is a writer, so it's yeah. just like, you know, this must be one of your favorite places in the house, <laughs> probably. It's a good spot, yeah. Yeah. And we have a lot of questions for him, so we're just going to jump right into it. But of course, you know, if you have things you want to comment regarding this video, please put them down in the comment section. There will also be links to your social media. I know you're active on Twitter, so if people want to interact with him there, you can definitely do it on Twitter. So my first question yeah. is, you're the president, of course, and you have been, you're into your second term, mm -hmm. but beforehand, like I mentioned, you're a historian yeah. and that's your, like, basically it was your life's work, right? What you Indeed, trained yeah. for at school, not a politician. <laughs> so what made you decide to run for president in 2016? Like, uh, chance, uh, which also connects with my work and uh, outlook uh, and perception of history and what matters in history. Chance, contingency, these are the defining and uh, powerful uh, movers and shakers in history. So, so there I was in the spring of 2016 and we had a political crisis. We had a prime minister who um, uh, found himself forced to resign and we had a government crisis of sorts. What happens next? That's what people wanted to know. Uh, and the office of the president uh, uh, could conceivably get involved. And I have been, uh, because my um, interest uh, and uh, speciality in history was in contemporary history, political history, history of the presidency, uh, and um, I was um, a fairly frequent commentator in the media. So we had this crisis and um, I had just finished uh, one of my lectures and uh, checked on my phone and I saw I had like, you know, I don't know, five or ten uh, messages and I could see immediately most of them from the media. Okay. So I picked up one of them, it was from Roof, the state broadcasting service. Uh, and they said, you know, we had this crisis in the morning. Uh, the, the, the prime minister uh, clearly uh, ending in his resignation. So we need you to uh, come and be with us and talk to us about what might happen next. Mm -hmm. So to cut a long story short, I was uh, live on TV for uh, quite a long time and then uh, continuously again uh, on TV and uh, giving interviews about what might possibly happen next uh, and what would be the role of the president uh, and so on and so forth. And at the same time in 2016, we had uh, a presidential election coming up in the summer. We had some uh, good candidates either announcing their candidacy already or declaring an interest, but there was nobody in that group who had sort of taken a clear and visible lead. Mm. And uh, as it happened, uh, people, um, a fair, fair number of people came to the conclusion that uh, since I seem to know a bit about the presidency, I might just happen to become an okay president. Mm -hmm. But before that, I had not uh, had any plans or dreams to become president. I was uh, happy in my uh, career as a historian, as an academic, and um, uh, had started a book on the presidents of Iceland. <laughs> so uh, uh, 
there was, to give you a short answer to a simple question, there, there was no clear motivation, unless you can call it a motivation, that uh, when it became apparent to me that I could become president if I actively sought that prestigious office, mm -hmm. I felt that I could uh, make a contribution, I could make my voice heard in that role, and I could uh, influence the way these, this office would develop mm -hmm. and hopefully do an okay job. And it's almost, I will readily admit, it's almost like uh, having the ring on your finger as in, you know, in the Lord of the Rings. Yeah, you yeah. Know, <laughs> once you start thinking about, uh, okay, I can probably become head of state of my home country if I want to. If I actually just say, yes, <laughs> go for it, create a group of people who will work with me then it's very difficult to say no to that proposition. So once you sort of realize that this is a, an achievable uh, object, then, then it's very tempting to just go for it. And sometimes it's, it's not, a, it's not, a, it's not a, an obvious rule, it's not a rule without exception, but in my humble experience, it's, I find it sort of e easier to regret what you did mm -hmm. rather than that which you did not do. That is true. Yeah. I mean, if you didn't do it, how could you know to regret it? <laughs> there we are. Yeah. So that's the reason. Like, just go for it and see what happens. And, exactly. and I mean, what would be the harm? I would have had a, a, a wonderful experience, and and here I am now. You yeah. know, second term, second going term, strong, yes. yeah. exactly. And a favorite of Icelanders in terms of the, your second time around. I believe like ninety over ninety percent. Yes. In terms of yeah, I mean every presidential election has its own momentum and own sort of uh, uh, peculiarities. But I was I was really happy to get the confirmation from my fellow Icelanders that they were happy with the way uh, I had conducted myself in office and how things were going. Yeah. So it's always good to get that. Uh, uh, massive support. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. It's very validating, I'm sure. Yeah, yeah, it made me feel good and uh, made me feel confident that uh, uh, my view on the role of the president corresponds with the uh, with the sort of mindset of the of, of, of the average Icelander. Absolutely, and I think a lot of times too, I've just been hearing this that you as a person, like you come off as very open, and I'm you know getting the same sense too, as in just a person that treats other people nicely and not like I'm president. Do you know what I mean? Well, that would never work in Iceland. But I mean, <laughs> I, uh, I don't know, like, you know, I, maybe it is because that I had no dreams or aspirations or, or plan even yeah. to it happen so suddenly. But I just decided I will do my very best, just like I try to do my very best in all other aspects of life. And uh, then we'll just see how it goes. But Icelanders in general uh, uh, are of the opinion that uh, we do live in a sort of egalitarian society. Of course, there are differences and uh, huge differences even between the richest and the, and the, and the poorest. Uh, and we are not, you know, some kind of paradise when it comes to everyone having uh, equal opportunities and uh, equal access to all the all the privileges you can get in life. But I think still that uh, there is a shorter distance between uh, a person on the street, so to speak, and the person occupying uh, a post like the one I'm I'm holding now. So. Uh, and I appreciate that. I appreciate the fact that I can go to the local swimming pool or a restaurant uh, or go shopping or whatever. And it does not call for the same uh, amount of uh, preparations or security. security or, this, or, yeah. or actually no, no preparation yeah. at all. Exactly. I, just, I just go about and do my job. <laughs> it's like, but, I'm going to go do this now. Yes, Bye. exactly. And, uh, <laughs> yeah. and you only get... Uh, positive feedback. You get kids saying hi president or Aww. something like that or uh, or somebody saying good to see you here or can I get a selfie? That, yeah. that's, the, that's the limit of, you know, uh, sort of uh, 
not abnormal, but unusual, unusual yeah, absolutely, things. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Or maybe you can get asked for selfies when you go. <laughs> <laughs> no, definitely not to the level you do. Through, the, through the fame of your <laughs> podcast. Through. There, there are fewer people that know who I am in, in comparison to you. So, All right, yeah. Yeah, and that's fine by me. <laughs> and I've, been, I've had the pleasure, though, of meeting Vicky yes. some years ago, and she was super nice, too. So to be fair, I, I've not met a lot of my Sunday presidents, but the ones that I have have been lovely and i think that is again and also approachable like you're saying which is so unusual especially coming from the united states which yeah. kind of brings me into my next point about the role of yes. presidents because whenever people hear president if they're from the u.s they think automatically the yeah. role that is by the prime minister and there's this kind of split that happens here and right second, yeah and so if you could talk a little bit about what your role as president is and how it differs than maybe what the prime minister does yes so we have uh a system of uh, we have a parliamentary democracy. So you have a parliament and uh, with 63 members and, um, and the government of the day uh, has to have the support of parliament. So you, you gain, you have, after elections, uh, you, you uh, decide who forms a government together. We have now uh, eight parties in parliament so it's difficult to form a coalition but it's coalition government and you get a prime minister with uh, her or his cabinet and uh, uh, the prime minister is the political leader of the day so the president does not get involved in politics on a day-to-day -day basis uh, so it's a combination of a ceremonial role uh, i go about delivering speeches uh, visiting uh, uh, towns and uh, parts of the country and uh, schools or hospitals or uh, what have you and uh, uh, there is this uh, aspect that the that the president and the head of state is a sort of a unifying symbol uh, talk about culture the Icelandic language mm -hmm. and try to focus on that which unites us but also to be a spokesperson for uh, or in my opinion to be a spokesperson for uh, Human rights, uh, diversity, uh, personal freedom, uh, freedom of religion, freedom of speech, freedom of love. Yeah. <laughs> uh, it's a nice, all nice combination of things. All the nice combination, <laughs> and and sometimes it, you're in a privileged position. So, so you have the politicians uh, who uh, have on their shoulders the responsibility of running the country and taking tough decisions, sometimes unpopular decisions. Uh, let me give you one sort of anecdote which describes this difference quite well. Okay. I was at a conference some years ago, before this government actually, and there was another government in power, a uh, conference on, uh, on, on the situation of, of children in society. And the minister responsible for that aspect uh, was also there. And both of us gave speeches where we both emphasized the need to do better in this category, and children are the future, and uh, we said, uh, I, in my humble opinion, both of our speeches were okay yeah. and were well received. But afterwards, in a Q&A session about what we should actually do, the minister got all the difficult mm. questions. I got all the applause. I was just saying we need to do better for the yeah. children of Iceland <laughs> and the children of the world. And everybody agrees with that. But when it comes to, okay, what are we actually going to do? Yeah. Then that's the responsibility of the minister. So you were in a sort of enviable position in that regard that uh, you are not uh, having to uh, to do the dirty work as it were, take difficult decisions. Okay. And that also, I have sensed this, I, it gives me also responsibility. I don't want to be the person who says, we have to do this, we have to do that, mm -hmm. and leave it to others to, to actually, uh, to actually uh, let deeds follow, follow words. But it is a position uh, in the sense that uh, uh, you are not in the business of politics, like I said, but having said that, mm -hmm. there are moments in on the political scene where the president does uh, have a vital role to play. Mm -hmm. uh, the president has to uh, confirm or ratify laws passed by parliament and has the option of refusing to do so if the president feels that 
parliament has somehow lost its way mm -hmm. or is not in accordance with the people's will or for any reason you don't even have to mention reason you would just refuse to sign a law wow. and when that happens the law in question takes effect still but there's a referendum and where the voters of Iceland decide yes we want this law to remain in force or not mm -hmm. so this is of course uh, uh, an important aspect of the of the president's role furthermore when you have to form a, a new government uh, usually after elections the president uh, plays an influential role in determining who gets the chance to try first to form a government mm -hmm. and how long that political leader should try to uh, to uh, to do so and if that attempt fails who gets the next chance to try to it's a very complex process and i actually i actually wrote uh, uh, a fair bit about that in my previous life as an academic and um, we've had two elections in my tenure as president and uh, parliamentary elections coming up later this year mm -hmm. and this has been uh, exciting for me in a way because I used to write about this but now I'm actually part of the process it's almost like you have a favorite TV program mm -hmm. and you get to be one of the characters you yeah. get to enter the scene I don't know uh, House of Cards, Game of Thrones, or yeah, something—you become one of the uh, one of the characters. Less brutal, though. less brutal, <laughs> yes, admittedly, uh, less brutal than that for sure. <laughs> Thankfully. <laughs> okay, and I mean it's also kind of fascinating because you're literally every day you're creating history in your role. Yes, right? sometimes sometimes not much happens, right. but if you take it all together, then you certainly influence the way the presidency develops and the way society works. Yes. Yeah. And as a historian, have you looked back and thought? There were certain presidents that did some things that you really liked, and you're like, "Oh, I'd like to cherry pick this." And then other presidents that did things, you're just like, mm, "Maybe not go down that route." Yeah, maybe you learn, and I, I should hope or think that uh, the presidents who succeed me uh, ultimately will learn from what I did uh, in a good way and learn from my mistakes as well. Uh, We've had uh, five presidents before me, and I remember, uh, like as an academic, I used to say that you can pick, you know, each of them did their work uh, satisfactorily and uh, nothing wrong with that. But you can pick some characteristics or attitudes from each one of them. Straight Pierce from the first one, you can see he was quite uh, knowledgeable about uh, politics and, uh, and the way things work, experienced diplomat. Ausker, Ausker, some of the next one, he had great charm and uh, uh, was the first one to really uh, uh, do state visits abroad and greet uh, other heads of state here in Iceland and did that with a lot of charm and respect. Uh, then we had Christian Eldjör, an archaeologist uh, outside the field of politics, unlike his predecessors, who uh, who delivered masterful speeches and so knowledgeable about Iceland, the culture and history. Uh, so you pick that from him. Mm -hmm. Then we had the uh, wonderful Vigdís Finnbogadóttir with her charm and elegance. And uh, uh, she was the first one to be really noticed on the international stage. The first uh, democratically elected female head of state. Uh, so you can bring um, bring that aspect of hers and then my immediate predecessor Ola Verakna Grimson also, uh, again a previous politician uh, who uh, uh, really influenced the way the presidency developed uh, unafraid to uh, to uh, say his mind vis-a-vis -vis the politicians in power and uh, very much interested in uh, promoting Iceland abroad. So if you take a positive uh, view of every single one of them, you can for sure say that all of them were uh, well qualified to be president and, uh, and uh, did their work with uh, well, satisfactorily uh, or more than that. <laughs> and, uh, and each one of them could bring something to the table to, for, for the next person to, to learn something. From. So, um, so in that sense, I think it was also of benefit to me to uh, to know a thing or two about the office, and uh, 
Uh, in general, I have also benefited, I think, from my background as a, as a historian and as a, as a teacher, as a history lecturer. Uh, I well remember one of the very first people I received in this house was Ban Ki-moon, former mm, Secretary yeah. General of the UN. And this was just weeks into my tenure and I felt, sorry, I felt like well, if ever there was a cause to have a nervous breakdown, then this is it. <laughs> a lot of pressure. Yeah, Ban Ki-moon coming here with a team of experts and yeah. officials, and I am going to uh, be his host, and we're going to have a meeting, and we're going to introduce him to Icelandic society and what we have to offer, for instance, in fields of geothermal energy and uh, sustainability, and so on and so forth. But then I felt, all right, Let's just take my experience from uh, academia, uh, from my background. Mm -hmm. Here we are. Okay, I am the lecturer. Ban Ki Moon is the guest lecturer, and all the others around the table are just students. This is just like a mm -hmm. seminar. It is my duty to make sure that everybody gets uh, their voice uh, heard, everybody is able to contribute somehow, and Ban Ki Moon, our distinguished guest, will. Will, will contribute what he has to offer. So, so I took you know, my previous experience and import, imported it to yeah. this whole new world I was so not accustomed to. Uh, so I think you know, the lesson from that, if there is a lesson, is that you know, we always have some kind of experience, some kind of background, and more often than not, we can somehow sh sort of shoehorn it into, yeah. into a new reality. Exactly. And primarily, don't be afraid. I mean, the guest in question was a very nice person. And yeah. so it's a person. It's right? a person, yeah. We all, you know, in this room, we all breathe in the same air. And uh, so, uh, yeah, I've learned that also. Uh, you get to meet uh, well known people, famous people, people in positions of power, and uh, uh, just, you know, keep your head up and uh, don't be afraid, and uh, yeah. everything will be fine. You hear that from the president of Iceland, just keep your head up. Yes. <laughs> it's all going to work out. Like, <laughs> very tataretas type of... Tataretas, <laughs> things will work out so yes. well. So in, in talking about that, because you, I like the fact that you had this challenging situation that you had to tackle and it brought in your strengths, mm -hmm. but I'm sure there's also things that you least like. So I want to start with the things that you least like about your role, mm -hmm. or maybe not as, you know, fun, and then the things that you like the most. Yeah, sure. Well, I remember when I was campaigning first in 2016 that... Uh, there were people there who knew a thing or two about campaigning and PR and stuff, and they said, you know, never talk about problems, only challenges. You never face, <laughs> you face challenges, not problems. <laughs> I forgot that very often. Yeah. Always talking about, well, it's a problem, but this and that. Uh, just be yourself. Though. Yeah. That is the key thing. Uh, I don't like having too much to do. Mm, okay. I and I've learned sometimes the hard way to say no. Mm. Uh, you don't want to disappoint people. You want to say, yes, I can go. I can attend that event in the northeastern part of Iceland. Yeah. But having said that, then I cannot be in the southwestern part uh, on, the same, on yeah. the same day. So you cannot, you cannot say yes to everything. And if it becomes too much, the interesting events become not so interesting. If you don't have the time to prepare, mm -hmm. I, I mean, I, I cannot read other people's speeches. I have to write everything myself yeah. and uh, I want to be well prepared. So if I am overburdened, mm -hmm. then uh, the tremendous honor that it is every day to hold this office becomes more of a tiresome duty. Yeah. And this is something you learn. Uh, I don't like I don't like it when I uh, don't appreciate how privileged I am, how fortunate mm. I am. Uh, if I let tiny details annoy me, I need to get sort of, how do you just say it in English, like get out of the funk or some other. Uh, yeah. yeah. I don't like it when I, when, I, when I get annoyed because of some things that are either beyond my control or are so pity when you come to think of it or so unimportant that you shouldn't waste your energy on getting annoyed about it mm -hmm. but i would say the same thing if i were in another position this is not something presidential this right. is not some head of state wisdom <laughs> i'm offering here uh, 
I also don't like uh, when people try to take advantage of me. Mm. Uh, Which I'm sure in this role has probably been maybe a little yeah, harder. I, I, I like, I don't want to be suspicious. Yeah. I don't want to enter a meeting or receive people and think, okay, they're, they're out there to get something from me and I have to be on guard. Wow. I, I don't, don't want to be in that frame. Yeah, absolutely. I want to be open, I want to be helpful, I want to listen. But I know sometimes that then you become vulnerable yeah. and I don't want to build a shield of sorts. But I've had some issues uh, or uh, there have been issues during my tenure where, where nasty things are said and mm. uh, uh, that is just an inevitable, inevitable uh, aspect of being in a public role and uh, you, cannot, you cannot let that uh, uh, have so, too, uh, too much uh, uh, effect on you but at the same time you don't want to isolate yourself completely from what is being uh, said about you out there yeah and I'm sure the more that you've learned to say no and have boundaries is yeah. when you come up against people's you know reactions that maybe aren't so happy about you saying no, <laughs> yeah. right because I mean I think that's just a, another like you're saying these are life like apply to life it's not just in a specific role but you probably have way more of these things coming at you than other people Probably, yeah. And, and you always, well, like, the, in an overwhelming majority of cases, when I have to say, no, I'm sorry, I cannot attend this event, but I send my best wishes, the reply is almost always, oh, we perfectly understand and wish you all the best and just hopefully next time or something like that. Great. So, okay. so sometimes you're sort of preemptively thinking that you're going to hugely disappoint somebody, yeah. and uh, whereas people understand the position you're in. Good. I'm glad to hear that. Yeah, yeah. Because it's so fun to be stressed for... Exactly. No reason, yeah. And sometimes, you know, or I, 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 I want to be busy, but I, it has to be managed. Yeah. You need to be able to have energy, self-care. Yeah. Like and COVID, of course, yeah. has affected this office and my position uh, so uh, drastically. Uh, you know, when you compare my lot to, to those who have been in the front line, uh, mm. Healthcare staff, teachers, uh, uh, to name but a you know tiny bit of the, of the population who have been doing tremendous work that yeah. I cannot complain. But having said that, uh, when you're in a position where your work is so much about meeting people and going places, then COVID, of course, affects uh, your day-to-day -day, uh, schedule. So it has been tough in that sense. But then you find other ways. You've tried to find ways to. Uh, appreciate what people are doing, sending thank you notes, thank you letters, uh, doing Zoom meetings or, or uh, uh, something of that note, uh, record messages and deliver them like that. We try to find ways around this and I think actually post-Covid we will use this new experience to, uh, to uh, get a new dimension to, uh, to, to this position and, and you know all walks of life. Absolutely. I think it's taught us all a lot about how we can communicate differently. Yeah. And even sometimes, you know, you can reach a wider range of people. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, just a f couple of weeks ago, I, uh, I attended an electronic uh, international summit. Uh, it's called the Christchurch Call about ways to combat hate speech mm -hmm. and uh, um, make sure that uh, terrorist uh, groups and individuals cannot uh, use the internet to their own advantage. Mm -hmm. And uh, a meeting of that kind would not have been possible or would have called for uh, much greater preparation and we probably we, the heads of state who took part or, or government uh, officials or representatives would have had to gather in some place and it would have been a massive operation. But there we were one evening all of us uh, online uh, and well prepared and uh, we're able to uh, uh, deliver the message and agree on the next steps but also having said that you know no matter how well you're prepared and no matter how many zoom meetings you've had and i won't name any names and it wasn't <laughs> me but there were occasions when they were like madam president uh, dear president you have to press the unmute button <laughs> We never learn, but it wasn't me. <laughs> it is hard because you're just so ready to say something, and you're just, yeah, and you're talking, yeah, exactly. and you're really into yeah, it, and everyone's yeah. like, 
we have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> Unless you're really good at lips reading. Yeah, we're on record currently. Yeah, 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 yeah. Hopefully, I mean, it says record there, so <laughs> we're, gonna, we're gonna go with it. And so, what do you like most, though? What do I like most? Uh, well, just as an individual, I like it a lot at the end of a long, busy day when I felt that I did well and that I look forward to the following day. But again, this is not something presidential, as it were. Yeah. This is just what I, since I uh, became an adult, I have always striven for this to be able to put my head on the pillow in the evening and say, Today was a good day. Yes. I look forward to tomorrow. This is basically the essence of a good life. Yeah, and, uh, it's difficult, and it's not going to happen every day. <laughs> and uh, you have to sometimes adjust your expectations, and you have to adjust or be reasonable in what you have achieved. Mm -hmm. But this is a good feeling to have. And what I like about being president is also the fact that things are going well. When things are going well, whatever position you hold, or whatever job you're holding, or whatever you're studying, and so on and so forth, you like it. Yeah. So if it weren't working well, then I'd be uh, more inclined to uh, say that this is not such an happy experience. So bec before becoming president, as I mentioned earlier, you have worked as a historian. And I think also one thing to clear up, because you mentioned you were on TV talking about the presidential election mm -hmm. and everything, is that you were commenting on other things beforehand. So you were kind of people were used to seeing you exactly, on yeah. television as well. Yeah, that was an asset in, in the campaign. Exactly. And so I was just wondering because as a historian, it must be super interesting. You've written books about Iceland and you've probably heard many people say stories, you know, that are like ah. that about Iceland, right? It's like <laughs> this thing is definitely what happens there. And you're like, actually, yeah. <laughs> this is not how that works. So I'm just wondering if there are any that come to mind that are stories that you've heard, maybe printed or whatever else, that is like, the actual truth is this. Yeah. I don't know. Let's take elves, for instance. Okay. There is this... <laughs> Everyone's uh, favorite topic, I think. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> sort of. There is this, I don't know, I, I, I get the impression that a lot of uh, foreigners believe that we believe in elves and I am sure that a fair number of my uh, fellow inhabitants of this island uh, truly believe in elves and I'm having yeah now that I'm just thinking out loud about this I probably don't want to be on record saying I do not believe in elves. <laughs> See this is what confuses people. <laughs> yeah. Why take the risk? You're right exactly. Uh, <laughs> and it's more like, you know, if you want us to believe in elves, we say to the foreigners who come to visit Iceland, we, sure, we'll believe in elves for you. Mm. If you think that's nice and funny and quirky, then we believe in elves. Yeah. Or when people believe that uh, Björk's wonderful, masterful, mysterious music is somehow because she is so closely connected to nature, and of course we know that mm. Björk is all for uh, sustainability and all for uh, uh, ways to uh, uh, preserve uh, our pristine nature and so on and so forth. I'm not saying that, but but maybe she just is a brilliant musician and has nothing to do with nature or Sigur Rós for that matter. Yeah. So uh, sometimes when you uh, create a possibly artificial connection between us and nature here, I will say that maybe it sounds nice and sounds plausible but uh, maybe there's not much more into it yeah. uh, i used to write about the cod wars mm -hmm. these were these were fishing disputes between iceland and primarily britain about access to the fishing grounds of iceland and it was of vital concern to us that we would gain sovereignty over the fishing grounds around iceland but the cod wars is a problematic term so, uh, because it was not a war in any uh, sort of uh, internationally recognized uh, uh, way. Uh, if, you, if you have a proper war, mm -hmm. there are casualties in at least measured in dozens or hundreds or thousands, which was not the case of Iceland. Uh, or you even declare war, you know, it depends on how we define a war. So, I was arguing that while this term is perfect and uh, you know 
it was a serious conflict and we've had like we've had trade wars and banana wars yeah. or what have you so yeah. we can equally have a court war but it was not a true war yeah. and i sometimes got the impression from even yeah from my fellow icelanders that they felt that i was sort of uh, downplaying too much the conflict <laughs> but i wanted to stick to the truth and come to the that brings me to the to the possible uh, conflict you can have between you know when i was in academia mm -hmm. my primary role was to be critical to not think first what's best for the government of iceland or for the icelandic authorities what would they like me to write right. no i want to be critical i want to be fair of course uh, and i want to ask difficult questions if difficult questions need to be asked but then you become head of state yeah. and it's almost like it's written into the job description to be a unifying uh, figure and to be optimistic. Mm -hmm. Can you imagine like if I were to start my New Year's address saying like, well, my fellow Icelanders, uh, the outlook is bleak and pretty <laughs> pessimistic about it all. <laughs> and we're, you know, we're not, we can't agree on anything. Uh, and we have all our differences and uh, there's coral here and disunity there and things are just not going fine for us. That would be taking it a step too far. Yeah. I would be the uh, the uh, typical uh, uh, almost privileged academic who cannot see outside the ivory tower of academia. Mm -hmm. But I feel we need to combine the two. You 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 can be optimistic. You can try to find that which unites us. But at the same time, be critical and at the same time be realistic. Mm -hmm. Because if you just create some kind of uh, uh, imaginary unrealistic uh, version of how things are and how things were and how things can be then you are just fooling yourself and people around you so let's just try to combine the critical approach that is needed plus the optimism that we are gonna do even better next year yeah great that I, is my take on it and i think too like we all need especially in times like this some optimism indeed but also managing expectations managing expectations for that sure is Yes. Most helpful thing. Yeah, sure. and uh, to uh, sort of realize also that uh, like respect for the past is a good thing, mm. but if it becomes too overbearing, if it becomes too conservative, too mm -hmm. nostalgic, mm -hmm. then it's an hindrance to inevitable and positive change. Uh, when people say the good old days. Good right? old days, yes. Like, yeah. Mm, mm, the yeah. way maybe we're not so good. Right. And we are on the right track. We can take, I don't know, let's take specific examples. Uh, bullying still exists in schools in Iceland. Very much so, yeah. Yes, it's a problem. But if I compare now how things are with, because I have children of school age, to the things I witnessed as a child. I was never I was never a victim of bullying and I was never a perpetrator either. Okay. But That's good. but I was there and yeah. said like, oh, I'm glad this is not happening to me. Yeah. So we are on the right track there because we know how it was and it wasn't sweet, it wasn't nice. Right. Uh, this is just one specific example. Uh, other examples, how we treated people with disabilities. We are on the right track there. Yeah. I'm not saying we're, we've reached some some end point where everybody should be happy, but we're on the right track. Right. Uh, gender equality. Uh, the one where I think Iceland gets probably painted the most as a utopia. Yeah, you should you should talk to Eliza about this. My wife yes. Eliza also because you know she is working on a book on gender equality yes. in Iceland. Coming out next year, I think. Yep, yep. coming out next year in, in, in for international audience, uh, but in Icelandic uh, in the fall. Oh, nice. Okay. Yeah, but. Uh, uh, we have to be careful not to just take in the applause and mm -hmm. as I say that it's the 11th year running I think or the 12th where we have topped the uh, yeah. <laughs> World Economic Forum's uh, uh, Global Gender Equality Index, Index. Yes. Yeah. so we can be proud of that yeah. we are doing fine, we're doing well right. but we can do even better and uh, we've had our uh, cases of uh, me too revelations which demonstrate forcefully mm -hmm. that uh, there is still so much work to be done and um, uh, while we have 
passed laws of equal pay for equal uh, work, mm -hmm. uh, to be totally gender blind there, uh, it doesn't transfer completely to what actually happens in the workplace. Right. Uh, when it comes to CEOs in the, in the private sphere, uh, women are woefully uh, underrepresented. Uh, in the public sphere, we're doing better. We have a, we've had, you know, one, we, we've had the, this as president, and uh, we've had we, the current prime minister is a woman, yes. Katrin Jakobsdóttir, the bishop of Iceland is a woman, yeah. and so on and so forth. So uh, all these positive changes sh should uh, encourage us to do even better. Right. Having said that, we're not there yet, and yeah. we will never be there completely. Right. It's, it's an it's a never-ending story. Progress, not perfection. There that's, we are. I, I try to work with that every day. It's just that's my motto: is I try to just progress. I'm never going to be perfect, but that's okay. And yeah, you know, I will use your... I will use that phrase. Yeah, great. Yeah. I'm glad. <laughs> and in terms of this house we're in, yes. So there's a lot of history yeah. in this house. I mean, mm -hmm. just this table actually that yeah. we're sitting at. Centuries old table. Yeah, and so you always like want to be really careful, right? Yeah. Um, so I'm just wondering: Are there any artifacts or anything about? this house history-wise that's super intriguing to you or you were excited about when you knew that you would come to live here? Well, I still feel a sense of awe when I approach Bessestadir. Yeah. Uh, awe in a positive sense. Like, Iceland became a republic in 1944, in the midst of the Second World War. Before that, uh, we gained sovereignty, oh, I'm turning into an academic novel, yeah, in 1918. <laughs> so we were, we were, to all intents and purposes, an independent state by 1918. But the king of Denmark was still sovereign. Mm. Then there's a war, outbreak of war in 1939. The Nazis occupied Denmark in 1940, and at that stage, Iceland, the Icelandic Parliament, decides: well, uh, Denmark is occupied. Uh, the king of Denmark and Iceland is basically uh, captive in his palace, mm. so we have to assume uh, sovereign powers. So they were transferred unilaterally to Iceland. And then there were meant to be, we had a union treaty with Denmark, there were meant to be negotiations on how we would maybe, if we wanted to, terminate that contract. Uh, the Danes were unable to negotiate or talk. They couldn't fly over to Iceland in the midst of the war. Right. So we unilaterally declared independence in 1944, much to the displeasure, displeasure yeah, of the king. Exactly. It's yeah, exactly. Like, what? <laughs> yeah. You cannot do this to us, we're occupied. Right. But anyway, we did it and became uh, uh, an independent republic in 1944 and elected our first president. Mm -hmm. And then, all right, you've elected a president, where should that person reside? Uh, Bessastadir was an obvious choice. It is uh, on a beautiful peninsula on the outskirts or close by Reykjavik. Uh, a beautiful building from the uh, late 18th century, uh, perfect for a head of state. However, this house was built for the representative of the Danish king. Oh. So there were people who said, hold on one second, mm. we're at last cutting all ties with the Danish oppressors, right. or with our Danish colonial masters. But having said that, pick anyone to become a colonial master and the Danes would be fine. They, were, they treated us well in many regards. Not all, but in many. So people said, some people said, Bessastadir has this history of being the site of the Danish king and his uh, representatives. Mm -hmm. So that's not possible. I, however, agree with those who chose this uh, place to be the uh, residence for the president. Like I said, it sits on a nice peninsula, it's wide open and it's, uh, it's refreshing and nice to hear tourists who come here and comment on that, how open it is, how free it is, how yeah. close to nature it is. So I, I take that from this, this, this history, that uh, we were perfectly willing to uh, be okay with the, with the Danish aspect of the history because this place is nice. Right. So we just oversee that. Just like the Parliament House in Reykjavik still has the Danish crown mm -hmm. on, on, the, on the building itself. Uh, and, the, and the king, uh, king, oh, I always mix them up, King Christian IX, if I remember correctly, who, who came with the constitution for us in 1874. Uh, There's a statue of him standing outside the Government House in downtown Reykjavik. 
so we are quite easy when it comes to this link with the past, which was not you know positive in all aspects. Yeah. And <clears throat> this makes me also think of all the big debates that have been in the States, for instance, about statues mm -hmm. about, from the Civil War era or, or, or remembering uh, generals and uh, important persons from the Civil War era and how we, how we tackle that. Mm -hmm. uh, here, at least, the uh, emotions uh, do not run as deep. Right. The issue is not as controversial. So yeah. we're quite happy to have a statue of, of a foreign king yeah. outside our government house. Yeah. <coughs> yeah, I do find that interesting just because obviously in the United States, as we, like you mentioned, like the history is, mm. it's enslavement, right? If we're going to go there in terms yeah, of exactly. why this is so <laughs> messed up to be honoring people who in essence were Indeed. fighting for yeah. keeping it. And you cannot compare it. We right. have a statue of the first, or you know, we traditionally known as the first settler of Iceland, Ingolver yeah. Arnarsson. He, he was a slaveholder, yes. but it was a thousand years ago. and. Yeah. Uh, and uh, a totally different aspect, you yeah. just cannot compare it. But you know, this house itself uh, is nice in many aspects. Uh, previous presidents used to live in this building itself until oh, right. 1996, whereas after that, uh, it was felt rightly that the combination of, a, of a, what you would try to describe as a normal household yeah. and the and, and, uh, and uh, presidential residence with everything that comes with that, meetings and receptions and what have you, did not mix well. So, yeah. so we live just like my immediate predecessor uh, in, a, in, a, in a separate house, just a stone's throw away. Yeah. But I like coming over here and uh, it has a nice feel. It's a small, I, I think, you know, uh, compared to the palaces I have been honored to visit, <laughs> yeah. it's small. Uh, and but it it fits the purpose. Yeah, I think it's a great thing too that they separated it because you imagine yeah. like having to tidy up all the time exactly. <laughs> before, yeah. before, before, before you were having another president or somebody come to visit you, and you're just like, oh, don't mind that stain from the kids or something. Exactly. Ridiculous. <laughs> and we, of course, my wife Eliza and I, like I have uh, one daughter from my previous marriage, mm -hmm. and then Eliza and I have four children, and uh, previous presidents uh, had. Uh, children here but the youngest one was uh, eight okay. uh, upon the parent becoming president whereas our youngest one was three years old and so hardly remembers anything else uh, but yeah you would not want or maybe you would want her running around here i don't know <laughs> it would really you know when it comes to iceland being so family friendly it would really feed into yeah. that narrative for sure yeah and i I honestly, you know, I, of course, I don't have the immediate comparison and can never, you know, put myself into uh, the uh, position of other heads of state. But I think, objectively speaking, pick a country to become a president with four children under the age of 10, mm -hmm. and Iceland would be very close to the top of that list. Yeah. We are a family friendly society. Uh, and I think because you mentioned gender equality, one of our biggest uh, uh, assets there is the fairly generous parental leave, evenly divided between a mother and a father, uh, assuming they're both around. Right. Uh, so that I remember fondly from my previous life, my pre-presidential life is is the paternity leave I could enjoy with the kids. Sometimes, of course, you know, if they slept nicely, if I, at least one of them had this habit of just sleeping three or four hours a day, and you could actually do some work then. Nice, yeah. But others were, of course, uh, more unpredictable. And but just this way to be able to uh, be with your child in those defining years, uh, that is something I really cherish. Yeah. I think it's very sweet. Like just on a personal note, my dad had worked all the time. Yeah, yeah. So it was so hard when, you know, we obviously had like vacation and things together, but yeah, it's like yeah. to get to know him as a person was so much harder because he was always at work. And in the US, we don't have this system. It's, it's yeah, like, I know, I know. Yeah. And um, I truly believe that uh, the way forward for any society that wants to become stronger, fairer and uh, better is to make sure that uh, parents 
have an opportunity to be with her children uh, and that it's not based on how well off you are because then divisions uh, stay in place or even increase right. and the more gender equality there is and the more uh, uh, rights parents have to take time off to be with their kids the happier people are and in as a general rule the happier you are mm -hmm. more likely you are to be of benefit to yourself and society absolutely agreed Agreed, yes, but there would be people who would say, socialism, evil. <laughs> yeah, well, some people are not going to agree. That's just life. That's well. just life, yes. Yeah. But if we convince people by uh, the sheer force of visible facts, yeah. then maybe maybe that will, you know, have an effect. I'd like to say that is true, but after having Trump as president, I'm not so sure <laughs> that facts are the things that people are always so concerned about. I'm just going to put that out there. <laughs> so in terms of um, when you be so when you went from being a regular citizen because you mentioned this like your life obviously having changed was there anything strange or kind of unusual surprising to you that you're like wow okay president this is this is how things are gonna be now you know like, I don't know I have been in this privileged position that uh, things have gone tremendously well mm -hmm. if I may say so myself and not not to you know not to keep praise on me per se, but just the way things work here in Iceland. Um, but of course I have learned through just being president that you are always uh, visible, yeah. but in a positive way. Like uh, I know that when I go through a shopping mall and trying to find a birthday present with, with one of the kids for a friend's birthday party that's coming up or something like that, right. I know that everybody's watching me. Not because, you know, not because I'm naked, not because I'm, <laughs> you know, somehow weird, but just because people know me. Yeah. Uh, and uh, you sort of build, you, you, you build a sort of radar of sorts that you, you, you are aware of the fact that everybody's watching you. Yeah. But it, I, I truly cannot complain. And uh, uh, I like to think that once this part of my life is over i will just be able to become another ordinary citizen and i'm pretty sure that that's how icelanders would want it to be yeah so uh, again i would like to emphasize the good aspects of icelandic society just as i want to emphasize that it's not a paradise and there's so much we can do even better but this is one aspect of icelandic society that i like you can uh, you can uh, hold a public position, I believe, and then just become one of the group again. Yeah. And we have this, we have this combination, I believe, that we want to have a safety net. And now I'm just speaking about myself, as, yeah. not speaking about myself as president, but in general, we want to have a safety net. We want to help people who need help for one reason or another. But at the same time, we, will, we want to give each individual the freedom to demonstrate to her or himself uh, what you're worth, what you can do mm -hmm. and to the benefit of that person and society as a whole. So I strongly believe that this combination of individual freedom and a safety net is the best way to run a, f a powerful, energetic, positive and fair society. Uh, and I believe that we here in Iceland can be an example to others in that regard. But we, we will never be an example to others if we just focus on appearances or if we just deliver a speech like I, the one I just delivered yeah. and things are actually not the way we want them to be. So I think it is of vital importance, for instance, that people who come to Iceland from abroad, who come to live here, uh, share that ideal and and hopefully or necessarily uh, feel that we are all in this together that we're striving to create and maintain a society on these notes because yeah. Icelandic society like we mentioned has changed so much yeah. when I was growing up the exotic kid in my class was the one who had a mother from Sweden <laughs> okay. I was the odd one out <laughs> Now we have people of all backgrounds, yeah. 
even uh, all religions, they've come from Poland, they've come from the States, they've come from Latvia, they've come from wherever. Yeah. Some of them are fluent in Icelandic, some of them do not speak a word when they come here. It puts a strain on the uh, educational system. It would be easier, I'm sure some teacher would say, if everybody just spoke Icelandic. But here we are, this is the society we find ourselves in, and we are going to make the best of it. Yeah. And to the benefit of all, because if your window to the outside world is a kid who has a Swedish mother, then you're at more risk to become like an isolated from whatever happens around you, and, and the risk increases that you become bigoted, uh, fearful of everything that's different, yeah. and uh, uh, stagnant. And uh, I can find more negative <laughs> if you want to, but this is my take on it. Yeah, absolutely, I agree. And I'm glad that Iceland has become more diversified. Yeah, we, it thoughts. benefits us. Yeah, exactly. It's like there's a whole lot that mixes together. And I, I also like that in certain areas, particularly like Reykjavik, where you have a lot more people who are diverse, there's been a lot more efforts to accommodate and integrate, and of course also celebrate different people's traditions. So it's like Iceland, Icelanders have their traditions and they find other traditions that they really like and they can celebrate those and people can do vice versa. You know, mm -hmm. In our house, it's a, it's a mixed bag of yeah. things and that's really nice. And I enjoy being accepted in that way that I have my things that I'm, they're not overlapping or uh, overtaking, but we're just combining them as a family. Yeah. And that kind of spreads out into the community. Yeah, actually, that's the way it should be. Yeah. yeah. Okay, and this question yeah. <laughs> is really fascinating to me. Okay, so you have to tell me if this is the case or not, but I read that you are technically related to Barack Obama <laughs> <laughs> as, as, a, as a very distant cousin, like yeah. 26 times removed, or yeah, yeah. So, yeah, something of that nature. So it, do you, do you, are you aware of this well, relation? <laughs> have you so, met him? so dear, dear you, all of you are watching, like Icelanders love genealogy. <laughs> we love finding out who's related to whom. There's even an app for it. Yes. And you know, yeah, there are stories you can tell about that. <laughs> uh, but uh, when uh, Donald Trump was elected president, uh, you could find genealogists in Iceland who would, could also find the connection between me and uh, than President Trump. Oh, interesting. So, okay. so you can connect anyone here to anyone if you go just far enough back. Yeah, so, okay. So uh, as as honored as I would be to consider Barack Obama part of the family, <laughs> uh, it's not that simple. Yeah, okay. But um, uh, this is, you know, this is also one aspect of being a small nation in the middle of the North Atlantic, uh, especially before the uh, fast and uh, rapid changes in the last two or three decades, yeah. uh, we were basically, all of us, related somehow. And, uh, you, there is a, it's called the Book of Icelanders in English, whereby you put in your ID number or name, mm -hmm. and the name or ID number of the person you want to see how you're related to, and then, voila, you can see that you, oh, we're third cousins, I didn't know that. Yeah, right. Yeah. <laughs> Which I feel like that always comes up when people talk about dating. Because it's, yeah, like, yeah. <laughs> it's like, are we too close to yeah. This isn't the best union. That's it, yeah, and it made the international headline. Yeah. Yeah. It's just hilarious to me. Okay, so I have questions from my patrons on yes. Patreon, and I asked them, you know, if you want to submit some questions for you. People were so excited about this, so Good. it's nice to be able to bring at least a couple to you. So from Jeremy, he asked, before assuming the office of the president, do you have an academic background in Icelandic history? Mm -hmm. When you leave office, what do you think you will focus on studying or writing about? Well, I am hoping, and it is my aim, to return to academia in some way uh, once uh, this part of my life is over. Uh, there were things I was working on. We did mention the Cog Wars, the fishing disputes, mm -hmm. and I've actually I've found time here and there to continue writing and researching about that. And those are my precious moments when I go into the archives and uh, just there by myself, and uh, uh, I can sort of connect with with uh, what is and was truly my calling yeah. to do research and write history and make history accessible to a general audience. 
So I will continue for sure writing about the Cold Wars. I've actually signed a contract to write books about it. Nice. Yeah, so we'll have to see how that goes in Icelandic and maybe maybe one day in English as well. Yeah. Uh, I'm pretty sure I would like to write in some way about my uh, experience as head of state, uh, especially the uh, political aspect of it, the connection with the political world. I don't see myself writing a tell-all uh, sincere uh, memoir <laughs> of how I felt. The scandal. It's just, yeah. <laughs> it would be a very short book. Yeah, exactly. It's like, mm. yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's just not in my nature. Right, yeah. Uh, but I, you never know. Uh, well, but, you have, you know, plenty of terms left if you decide to run. So well, we'll yeah. see. You take one day at a time and, uh, <laughs> and never assume that anything is taken for granted here. But, uh, Yes, I would like to write about uh, Iceland's contemporary history with, uh, yeah, definitely the fishing disputes, the yeah. Cod Wars. So you're calling them fishing disputes, is that how we should be? <laughs> well, Cod Wars is a fine term because yeah. it's sort of, it's it's uh, nice, it's exciting, it makes you interested. Cod Wars? Yeah, you're like, yeah. what? In Iceland one? Like, yeah, <laughs> the Iceland one for sure. Yeah. But having, yeah, I don't know, let's leave that okay. because I don't want to disappoint any, any I, I patriotic Icelanders. I am one of my coming up videos because I do find it super fascinating. I did like a podcast episode about it and I think a lot of people were just stunned uh, just uh, that this even happened, that there was this. Yeah, you know, yeah. No, and it's part of a wider struggle. Like, I mean, yeah. the uh, states in South America were at the forefront um, uh, declaring wide uh, fishing limits with exclusive rights yeah. to fish for themselves and it caused conflicts with, with nations all over, with, with the US, with with the, the then Soviet Union, with Japan, and so on and so forth. So it wasn't only a unique Icelandic right. struggle. Okay. So my the next question, and yeah. last from my patrons, is from Liz. And she asks, as an individual who has translated the works of Stephen King yeah. into Icelandic, what is your favorite work by the author? That's one part. And then is there any literature you would love to see translated that has not been? Sort of into Icelandic. I think yeah. she means into Icelandic. All right, yeah. Well, let's begin with Stephen King. Uh, well, you know, I would almost say like I was young, I needed the money. But <laughs> it was a tremendous honor and I have the utmost respect and admiration for Stephen King as a writer. Uh, and I think sometimes his works are downplayed a bit because mm. uh, some of them uh, are uh, uh, of a genre that isn't really considered respectable, but in my opinion, as, an, uh, as someone who translated his works and as somebody who, who enjoys literature, and I like to think I know a thing or two about literature, his, his work is of superior quality. Yeah. It's like Nobel Prize quality. Yeah. So uh, uh, there I was uh, needing money during my university years and uh, got this uh, offer to translate Stephen King novels into Icelandic. Uh, and I remember how long it took me first. And it wasn't really when you, when you considered the uh, amount of time and the actual amount of money you got, wasn't that impressive. Yeah. But I got better at it. And uh, one thing I did, I think in the second or third book I translated was to not read it first. Mm. Because I just decided I'm just going to translate because then I have to continue translating to know what happens next. Okay. <laughs> so I, would, I just wouldn't stop. Yeah. I would work into the early hours because I had to know, you know, who did it. Uh, I prefer uh, his fiction, uh, his sort of realistic fiction, mm -hmm. where, you know, where nothing supernatural. Right. And uh, my favorite movie of all time, and I think, uh, IMDB agrees with me. Is uh, is uh, it's Sh the Shawshank Redemption? Mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a great it's, movie. Yeah. It's just magnificent. Yeah. And I translated that book, that story into Icelandic. It's called, you know, Rita Hayworth and the Shawshank Redemption. Uh, and if there's anyone who hasn't seen that movie, I won't go into any details mm -hmm. about why Rita Hayworth is there. Yeah. But there we are. Uh, that's just one fascinating story, uh, rich in detail, rich in drama, and demonstrates so well the triumph of the human spirit. Mm -hmm. The work that would even say affected me most 
or upset me even, okay. who is a book uh, called Dolores Claiborne okay. about a very tragic uh, situation where a woman is uh, is harassed and uh, uh, leads a miserable life because of her violent uh, husband yeah. and uh, a daughter gets involved as well and it is a very rich story in the uh, in descriptions of evil I would almost say like, mm -hmm. of the of how humans can be bad yeah. uh, and I remember are you really going to have this happen? Yeah. Well, it was the sense when I when I was translating the story, but again, uh, it's it's fiction. But we live in a rough world. It's not, you know, it's not rosy. Yeah. And uh, fiction can sometimes be uh, a better way to describe things than uh, than uh, non-fiction. So even though I'm a historian by profession and I just cannot make things up when I write, <laughs> yeah, that I, be good. I just can't. <laughs> I, I cannot. I'm very poor at creating scenery and stuff like that. You know, the the air was thick with the skies dark skies when the gunship you know entered the scene but yeah. I just can't do it I just have to write just footnote here this happened footnote there yeah. but still in a nice way though but Stephen King masterful writer uh, his book on writing is also one of the best short volumes I have seen and read on how to write okay. and I recommended it to my students and uh, I would recommend it to anyone so uh, yeah, uh, but translated, translated into Icelandic, I don't know, I mean, there are, Icelandic is a language, a thriving language. It's a language still uh, under attack, as it were, Yeah. Uh, in, especially in the modern world of, uh, of uh, smartphones, cell phones and voice command and what have you. Uh, if I want to know what time it is and I would have my phone with me, I could easily grab the phone or, you know, well, I would see then, then. let's take a better example. <laughs> okay. If I had to know here and now what the, uh, what the capital of uh, Paraguay is, mm -hmm. then I would grab the phone and say, hey Siri, what's the capital of Paraguay? Mm -hmm. I could not say, Segu mi Siri, yeah. que no hubo por Paraguay, because Siri does not understand. Right. Icelandic, not neither, neither does Alexa, not yet, we're working on it. Mm -hmm. There is a big project and we have to do this. Uh, we, pastime of many Icelanders involves quarreling about how to decline nouns in the most correct way and so on and so forth. Yeah. But Which after, is very difficult. Yeah. <laughs> I know personally. Eliza, Eliza, my wife, jokes about uh, the fact that she would order five items of everything. Yeah, because so when she, it comes to number five, you don't have to decline. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So you know this. Yes. <laughs> I've had a teacher encourage us to do that. They're like, just have five beers. Don't worry about it. <laughs> yeah, it has its advantages. Yeah. So, um, so you know, that is, of course, part of... Uh, debate about good Icelandic, bad Icelandic, what have you, yeah. but the future of the Icelandic language depends so much on how we get Icelandic into, into our gadgets, into our smartphones, mm -hmm. into our computers, uh, into our refrigerators or cars, yeah. whatever. And furthermore, uh, because we have touched upon the great change in Icelandic society, we must be tolerant towards a we, by we, I mean people who are born and bred here, who learned Icelandic from day one and uh, speak with uh, no accent because there are few accents in Iceland. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a bit, you know, a bit of a difference between people in the north, people in the west and the rest of the country, right. but, but more or less it's the same way, spoken the same way. We must be understanding and tolerant towards those who are learning the language, who make funny errors. <laughs> And I'm, I'm guilty of that. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, I've said some very silly things in English, even though I studied in the UK for eight years and claimed to be okay, an okay English speaker. You're more than okay. Uh, yeah, this is the okay. modesty. <laughs> yeah. Modesty is one of my many great strengths. <laughs> so, we must be tolerant. Yeah. 
and we must accept uh, accents, uh, different accents, mm -hmm. and it just enriches us. Right. Uh, but I know, for instance, you know, I lived in the UK, and you would have people with all kinds of accents: Scottish accents, Irish accents, Welsh accents, Indian accents, uh, Cockney accent, whatever. Yeah. And everything is accepted because it's so diverse. Right. But having said that, people would be judged. I, I studied at Oxford, you know. Mm -hmm. I know that people yeah. would be judged on their accent. Right. And we don't want that here. We want to be able to say this is one language we speak here. We want to help people to learn it because, you know, I think. I think you will never be able to enter Icelandic society fully if you have no grasp of the language. Agreed. And and that is not unfair. I want to be open-minded, I want to be tolerant, I want to be uh, cherishing diversity. But at the same time, I have to say, sorry folks, if you're going to live in Iceland, mm -hmm. then the stark fact of the matter is that Icelandic is spoken here. Right. So if you can't get by, I know people who speak very little Icelandic, I'm perfectly happy here. But if you really want to be able to go to your parental meetings or enjoy, uh, you know, a football commentary on a game in Iceland or whatever, or uh, get a, get really uh, into Icelandic poetry. Yeah, go to a party. Go to a party. At parties, it's very easy to be isolated at some point. Because a lot of people will start in English. And I remember when I was first learning Icelandic, and I'm still learning, of course. But yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm still learning. Yeah, that. exactly. It's a lifelong thing yeah. for sure. <laughs> But, you know, everyone starts off in English to be polite, but it's very natural because that's your natural, your your, nat your native language to just speak in Icelandic at some point. And then that person's just sitting there drinking, kind of looking around, you know, like keeping themselves busy. And it's like, you're unfortunately missing some yeah. aspects of, you know, social life as well. But I've, I've also uh, heard and learned and experienced that Icelanders can be too quick also to revert from Icelandic to English, maybe mm. because out of politeness or somehow some kind of laziness that, yeah. okay, this person is a poor speaker of Icelandic, yeah. let's just demonstrate to her or him and the world how great an English speaker I am. So how do you like Iceland? Do you really <laughs> enjoy being here? Yeah. <laughs> but, <coughs> sorry, it's not, it's not tied to Iceland per se. I remember, yeah. like, we learned Danish in school, yeah. people who go to the school, through school system here in Iceland. So, I have it as an aim when I am in Denmark to try to speak Danish. So before becoming president, if I would go to the railway station and say like, I am going to go to the from Copenhagen to Hamburg in Tyskland. What might it cost today? And yes, sir, the price is... <laughs> Yeah. So the Danes are equally as bad as Yeah, I think also the way that Danish is said is so difficult. That's what makes yeah, that language really it's, hard. It's not, it's not pronounced, it's not said. It's yeah. just, it just somehow Float. evaporates. Uh, yeah, exactly. <laughs> I've heard you have to sound like you're swallowing at the same time while you're speaking or something in order to make it work. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. But I, I think also, too, with the my experience, sometimes if people hear not only a mistake, but maybe an accent that too might make them think, oh, I'll just help them out yeah. by speaking in English. And then, like you said, some people want to practice and yeah. it can really vary. And so it's it hard varies. to know if the person is being disrespectful because I, I often don't think they are, meaning like, no, no. you know, sidelining your Icelandic. But as a person who is actively trying to learn, sometimes I just ask them like, if I play, if the term of our Icelandic, yeah. you know, like- Exactly. And, then, and in my optimistic outlook on life, I like to think that people are trying to be nice when they switch to one language or another and would be perfectly happy if, exactly, instead of you sulking and yeah. thinking like, oh, come on, in your mind, yeah. instead of and saying, yeah, yeah. Because yeah. you, your feelings get hurt because you're putting yourself out there, you're feeling vulnerable. And that's yeah. where we just kind of have to take our feelings out. I've learned hard. I've cried many times. Oh. So I know, I know. You have to yeah. stop for a second and go, okay, how can I in this situation, change it so that I'm not, you know, yeah. my expectations can be managed as well. I also want to emphasize, yes, we agree, Icelandic is a tough language to learn. Yeah. You know, declensions, uh, three uh, genders and what have you want, uh, all the rest of it. But there are languages that are way more difficult yeah. to learn. And yeah. here we are, I mean, Chinese, I mean, yeah, yeah plenty, whatever. So, like, yeah. And your background, like you, you don't have to tackle with different alphabets yeah. and the, the, the same grammatical rules apply more or less. But 
if you think about people from uh, Southeast Asia who come here with a totally different language, and they come here to uh, into uh, uh, a new world in many ways, uh, working hours are long, yeah. and then if you're expected to, on top of that, go to a, some kind of school and learn a new language and become master of it in a few years, that's just totally unrealistic and yeah. more than that, totally unfair. Yeah. So yeah, people do it. <laughs> people, yeah, people, and I admire them so Me much. Me too. Yeah. I do as well. Yeah. Okay. We, we, we probably talk about this all day. <laughs> we can indeed. But I'm going to go on to my last question. Yes. Because I know you have other things to do. And that is the question I ask everybody, mm -hmm. which is, what is your favorite Icelandic word or phrase? Oh, you caught me off guard. <laughs> a very sort of... Uh, lo logical or even popular way would be to say and use the old phrase Þetta reddast, which means things will work out somehow which to many people uh, puts in one sentence Icelandic attitude yeah. on life but I, again this is something we also do because others like to think this about us we aren't this disorganized. So <laughs> maybe not. Like like <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> but it's an outlook that has its positive side. Mm -hmm. uh, things will work out somehow means that you are not uh, fearing for what happens next. Yeah. And you are willing to tackle it. And you have the confidence that you can do it. It's a can do attitude. It's good in many ways. Uh, it has the negative side that you do not prepare for what's ahead of you and you overestimate sometimes uh, your qualities or capabilities. Yeah. Uh, but if you always know your limits, then you're never going to take that extra step. So it's good in that sense. Yeah. It's horrible if you want to become like an international financial center. We tried that and failed miserably. <laughs> like... then, then the outlook, things will work out somehow, does not work well for you. But uh, if I had to choose a word, uh, I don't know, man. I remember that the um, uh, word Ljós mm -hmm. uh, was once elected the most beautiful word in Icelandic. Uh, midwife. Yes. You know, and literal translation would be the mother of light, mm -hmm. somebody carrying the light. Yeah. And it's such a beautiful way to describe the birth of a new life, yeah. or a new person coming into this world. Exactly. So, Ljós Móðir, you cannot find that word uh, ugly somehow. No. Uh, and all the positive words, Vættum Þykja. Vættum Þykja. which yeah. basically, Þykja, Vættum, but yeah. you just mix up the order of the words a bit, to feel to care for somebody, yeah. to, to have a good feeling about somebody. Find them thick. Yeah, it's a nice word. Yeah. Uh, and then you know, uh, peculiar words like do labor. Yeah. How do you say <laughs> do labor? Uh, I, that's a good one because uh, it's like you're hard working, but it's not exactly about hard no, work. No, it's about. Diligent somehow. Yeah, yeah. it's a, I'm not sure how to translate yeah. that. But it is one of those words that you say to somebody when you really want them to know that you're proud like of what yeah. they did. Or, you must have do it. Yeah. Oh, how diligent you were. Yeah. And that also is an aspect of Icelandic society and Icelandic outlook on life, which can have its negative aspect. Mm. Life was tough here for centuries, just like it was in many parts of the world, or all parts of the world, yeah. come to think of it. But particularly harsh here because of the surroundings, harsh nature, uh, and a way of life which meant that if you were not dugleg or dugleger, then you would die. Exactly. <laughs> if you were not willing to put in all the effort needed to survive, then that's the end of it. Yeah. So maybe it's in our DNA that unless you are diligent or hardworking, then you're in for trouble. Yeah, and to praise it so people and to continuously yeah. be dugleger or dugleg yeah. or dugleg. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, uh, but I will stick with Ljós Móðir. Okay. What a beautiful word that is. Yeah, I think we have a really a good group of them. So, and Dulleir, I don't think it's one that's been said yet, so. Yeah, okay. 
Well, thank you so much. This My has pleasure. Been awesome. People, I'm sure I've learned things. I'm sure a lot of other people who are watching have learned and are appreciative that you have spent some time with us today. Pleasure and honor and um, all the best to all of you and stay safe. <laughs>